Great, thank you. My name is Arnie Gell. I am delighted to be presenting a guest lecture tonight for chapter part of chapter three and uh, met Bob at Entrain and we both share a love for weather. Uh, I am based in uh, District 11, but due to job transfers had previously started my um, auxiliary career in 11 South and then was in uh, one North. So I've seen uh, different parts of the auxiliary and, and different parts of the country. Um, and I currently serve uh, a second time around as a Florida Taylor commander and am also a branch chief in the uh, training directorate on the national staff. And uh, as I mentioned, met uh, Bob at, at N-Train. Um, in terms of weather background, besides having gone through both the old Oxley, the new Oxley, having taught in both, uh, I've served as a uh, NWS um, uh, Skywarn uh, spotter and uh, taken uh, Marine Weather University as well as a meteorology course on the side. So uh, share, share Bob's love for the weather. Um, Bob, did you want to uh, share your screen? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you have the slides available? Did you want to take uh, a picture? Sure, I do have the slides. I didn't know if I was a presenter or not for the meeting. Well, I just, I just made you co-host. Um, and so okay. what we'll do is Arnie will take us halfway through uh, and then I'll pick up where he left off. This chapter involves latent heat. And latent heat, for some reason, it's it's really challenging, and that's why we kind of had a drop off of students. Um, and it's a fascinating topic, as you know. You know, I I, I love studying weather, and so the fact that uh, latent heat is just a source of immense energy, especially in uh, you know in uh, hurricanes and uh, in thunderstorms, it's very exciting. So what I'm going to do for those of you that are new, I'm going to go ahead and have Arnie share his screen. And just for bandwidth issues, go ahead and stop your sh video sharing. Uh, if you know how to do that on the bottom of the screen there, and go ahead and mute yourself. And that way, uh, hopefully we'll get a nice crisp presentation from Arnie here. Do you, do you have the slides available yet, Arnie? I can keep talking if I, I can tell tall stories if you need me to. There. Yes, so I have just stopped my video and started sharing the screen. Let me know when you can see it. I can see it and uh, take it away. If you, what I'm going to ask people, if they do have questions for you, is not to bother you, is to go ahead, put them in the chat, and then Chaz will respond to them. And if it's something of an urgent nature, uh, he will then hop in and uh, ask you directly. Okay, great. Take so, it, Arnie. as we mentioned, uh, tonight's chapter is on moisture, latent heat, fog, and stability. Uh, in addition to the uh, T Directorate, reviewed and approved slides. I do have several enhancement slides that I will uh, try and show. Uh, and uh, I think that these will help with some of the material, but very importantly, these have not been reviewed uh, at the training directorate, uh, nor will they be on any test. So in terms of just the agenda tonight, We'll be talking about the composition of the atmosphere um, and dry and with water vapor, uh, the vertical structure of the atmosphere in terms of uh, the various layers, the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere, uh, definition of lapse rate. We'll talk a little bit about uh, adiabatic process and uh, related uh, lapse rates. Uh, dry adiabatic lapse rate, the wet adiabatic lapse rate. Uh, I'll present uh, one enhancement slide there. Uh, we'll talk about the properties of water, specifically the phases of water and the change among them and the latent heat of phase changes. And I have an enhancement slide there, uh, talking in specific, more specifically about uh, how moisture in the atmosphere is reported in terms of absolute humidity and relative humidity uh, and dew point. I have uh, one in, uh, enhancement slide there. We'll talk about various fog types, formation and dissipation. I have uh, my last enhancement slide there, and then I will turn it over to Bob 
uh, to talk about atmospheric stability uh, and uh, both uh, absolute and conditional as well as instability, uh, go through an example and then a number of review questions to end the, uh, the evening. So without further ado, when we think of the atmosphere, uh, most of us think of its major constituents being nitrogen, approximately 78% of the atmosphere and oxygen, 21% of the atmosphere. Uh, the other 1% are made up of other gases, uh, including carbon, di carbon dioxide, which you may have heard of in terms of greenhouse gases, uh, as well as uh, other rare uh, gases and, and uh, lighter uh, gases, including neon, helium, and methane. Uh, and also there's a variable amount of water vapor uh, due to uh, weather effects that we'll be discussing tonight. Uh, the structure of the atmosphere includes uh, four major layers, and then there are three uh, boundaries uh, between them. And uh, these change vertically as one moves up in the atmosphere. And the primary distinguishing feature for our purposes will be uh, the temperature change uh, with height. So uh, in the troposphere, that's the layer uh, which is most important uh, for weather. And there, uh, as the uh, height increases, the temperature goes down. Uh, then uh, in the stratosphere, uh, temperature uh, increases. And some of these types of increases uh, may uh, relate, uh, for example, uh, to ozone uh, and absorption of ultraviolet radiation and uh, increase in temperature. Uh, then uh, above the stratosphere, uh, there is the mesosphere where temperature goes down. And then uh, in thermosphere, again, here due to more pressure effects, uh, the temperature actually uh, increases uh, with height. And then that sort of fades away into space. Lapse rates uh, refer to the way the temperature uh, decreases or increases with altitude. And uh, there's an environmental lapse rate that is what is seen as any given time and place and that changes with altitude. And uh, those were shown on the prior slide as averages. So in the mid latitudes, it averages about a loss of three and a half degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet in the lower troposphere. The dry adiabatic lapse rate is how fast unsaturated air cools as it gets pushed up and nominally, it's at a loss of 5.5 uh, degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. And there is the wet adiabatic lapse rate, which is how fast saturated air cools uh, as it is pushed up. And its nominal value is lower. It's about a loss of 3.2 degrees per thousand feet. And uh, the reason for these differences uh, will be discussed uh, later in the chapter. And uh, presently, we'll be talking about the definition of the term adiabatic on the next slide. So talking a little bit more about lapse rates, the average environmental lapse rate is shown in the figure on the right top. Uh, air is not rising. Uh, you can see that uh, in this case, what we're referring to is what the observer would see if uh, your eye were sort of moving up and down the atmosphere. So you can see that at sea level here, uh, mid latitude, we have a temperature of 80 degrees. Uh, then uh, there's a drop of three and a half degrees when you go up to a thousand feet, another three and a half degrees when you go up to 2000 and, and so forth. The adiabatic lapse rates are named for what is known as an adiabatic process. And this is a term uh, that is out of thermodynamics. And it refers to a process that occurs without the addition or loss of energy uh, from tide of the system. Uh, and in an adiabatic system or process, uh, air that rises uh, expands and uh, with that expansion, you have uh, less motion of the molecules in a given 
uh, volume and therefore that results in cooling. And as air sinks, uh, the air gets denser. Uh, there's more motion in the given volume or parcel of air and therefore uh, it warms. And this is shown in the diagram on the right. So uh, you may have uh, an air parcel here at showing 30 degrees centigrade. Uh, then uh, as it rises, uh, it cools, it gets larger uh, and uh, drops to 20 degrees centigrade. And then uh, it may uh, cool even further, uh, expanding further, dropping to 10 degrees centigrade at 2000 feet. Uh, and then if you were to uh, descend, it would contract, it would increase uh, with that compression to 20 degrees at 1000 feet and then uh, return to its 30 degrees at uh, near sea level. And I'm going to try and uh, project a, another uh, slide that is... Uh, a... Go ahead. Sorry, a quick, quick comment. Uh, those, are, those heights are in meters, not feet. Thank you for correcting that. Uh, so the uh, top diagram um, was in feet and the uh, by it, the bottom uh, diagram uh, is uh, metric and it uh, was in um, meters. So thank you for that correction, Bob. Um, was me. All right. Are you looking for your uh, special slides or are you trying to get back? Did you get kicked off there for a second? Uh, I'm going to go to my special slide for a moment. Ooh. And um, let me just. Uh, so while he's digging that out, I'll share one note that I did want to make note of, which is that. As you remember from that one depiction of the four different layers of the atmosphere, um, there's a lot more variations in temperature down here in the tropo uh, sphere. You got snow on the ground in winter, you got land, uh, you got ocean. So, but when you get up to the uh, stratosphere, now there's not as many impacts. So the temperature isn't quite as variable as it is down here in the troposphere. And uh, back to you, Arne, sorry. Thank you. So uh, what I wanted to mention is that the, the adiabatic process is sort of idealized and um, something that, that generally happens is that uh, we have the effect of the sun, which during the day can obviously, you know, uh, heat up the atmosphere as sort of illustrated by the uh, diagram on, on the left. So this will become important uh, when we, we get to uh, one of the uh, slides, just a couple down, but I wanted to bring up that concept. All right, so let me get back into the presentation here. And can everyone see this now full screen? Looks good. Okay. Yes. So we're going to talk a little bit now about the properties of water. And the water is, you know, one of the, the key molecules that makes life possible. And it has some unusual properties compared to other liquids. It expands when it's frozen uh, and therefore ice can float. It also has a number of uh, changes of phase at temperatures uh, found around the earth. For example, uh, going from a solid to a liquid uh, and uh, then to a water vapor. And it's also an excellent solvent for uh, uh, other organic uh, chemicals and therefore is an integral part of, of not only the weather, but also uh, life. And its properties are also well suited to weather processes. Uh, as we'll talk about presently, it results in the release of a fair amount of energy when it either condenses or freezes. Uh, it 
uh, absorbs uh, infrared uh, radiation or energy. Uh, it uh, by um, uh, transport can move energy from one place to another. And it's also extremely abundant uh, uh, on the earth. Uh, some of the other properties that are important uh, is that uh, the amount of water vapor in the air uh, as uh, measured by weight will vary from less than 1% in very dry air to uh, say about 4% in very moist air such as in the tropics. Uh, moist air is actually lighter than dry air and this may seem counterintuitive, but if we think of uh, the molecular weight of each of the constituents of air. Uh, remember that molecular weight depends on, uh, if you remember your, your chemistry or physics, uh, the sum of both the um, neutrons and protons in a molecule. Uh, nitrogen has a molecular weight of about 28, and it, uh, oxygen has a molecular weight of 32, and argon has a molecular weight of 14. If you take a weighted average of those, so if you take 79% of 28, 21% of 32, and uh, less than 1% of 14, that averages out to an average weight of 28.7. Water, however, has a lower molecular weight of 18. So for every molecule of air that on average is replaced by one of water, that lowers the weight of the air, taking it from 28.7 down by 18, or lowers it by 10.7 grams for every 18 grams of water itself. And how does that play in, into this? Well, there are phases of water as shown below, um, and uh, you have ice, uh, the ice can melt, into water. And when that transition happens, uh, uh, there are 80 calories uh, uh, that uh, is called the latent heat of fusion. Uh, and then water uh, can evaporate, becoming water vapor. And uh, that involves uh, a transition of 540 calories, the late so called latent heat of vaporization. So uh, when you have ice uh, going directly to water vapor, uh, that process is called sublimation. So that involves 80 plus 540 or 620 calories of heat per gram uh, in that transition or Conversely, when you have water vapor uh, that condenses in deposits um, and then goes back to ice, uh, the reverse occurs. Uh, you first lose 540 and then 80 and um, uh, for a total of, of 620 in the other direction. Now, notice that they don't, what they uh, don't talk about is what's happening uh, with uh, water itself and for example, going from ice to water, so you're, you're thawing and then uh, water uh, evaporating uh, to water vapor. And then this goes back to the slide that I showed you a little bit ago. I'll put that back up and now we'll look at the right-hand side of that slide. And you can see that it shows a graph uh, showing a temperature uh, on the vertical axis. Uh, remember in centigrade, uh, water freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100. So it makes for nice even uh, divisions. And then the amount of heat that you either put into the system uh, as, you, as you go to the right is just shown in arbitrary uh, units on uh, the X axis. And you can see that if we have uh, say ice at the bottom, somewhere between minus 30 and zero degrees, uh, that ice is showing an upward slope as it warms up. And uh, similar to this latent heat, uh, it, it takes actually a lower amount 
of heat to warm the ice. It takes about a half a calorie per gram. So as ice warms up, it's going out of the slope um, uh, as indicated. Then you have a, a short horizontal line and that, and that is your latent heat diffusion at 80 calories per gram. And you basically have to might, uh, excuse me, melt all of the ice in that block of ice uh, before the in an idealized state before then uh, that uh, can start heating up again. So all that ice will melt into water at 80 calories per gram of heat. And then you can start uh, warming that water up. And here the specific heat of water is a little bit higher. It's at one calorie per gram. So you would add say another, for one gram of ice, you would add another 100 calories uh, to warm that water up. Uh, to the boiling point. And then uh, you have another horizontal line. And this is where all the water boils. And for one gram of water, it'll take you 500 calories of heat added to the system. For example, as shown by the kettle here, uh, to boil off all the water to you have all steam or water vapor. Uh, and that could even then uh, be superheated um, uh, steam at a rate of uh, 0.48 calories per gram to, to get even hotter uh, as, it, as it boils off uh, as vapor. So uh, with that as uh, additional background, we'll uh, go back to the slides and talk about, again, the importance of latent heat. Uh, again, latent heat is the what is tied up in water. Uh, it's 80 calories per gram, and then an even larger amount uh, has to be added to transition to water vapor. And it's carried with the water vapor component as it goes uh, to various places uh, in, in the atmosphere around the earth. And this transport of latent heat is added to uh, what occurs by either uh, direct conduction, uh, by convection, or by radiation. And this condensation of water is one of the key drivers of of various weather phenomena, as you'll talk about elsewhere in the course, such as thunderstorms and hurricanes, the cause of the released heat of condensation uh, gives energy into the system. So we're going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about some of the measures of humidity and uh, the concentration of water vapor in the atmosphere is reported in three different main ways. Uh, first is absolute humidity, and this is considered the, the mass or weight of uh, water vapor in any given mass of air, and it's normally expressed as grams uh, per kilogram of dry air. So uh, the, the mass the air can hold uh, uh, will increase with increasing temperature. Uh, and then there's relative humidity, which is a percentage. It's essentially a ratio of the mass of water vapor in the air to the maximum it could hold at any given temperature, again, expressed as a percent. And then the third uh, concept is a, the dew point, which is the temperature the air would have to be cooled in order to be saturated. So at that point, what happens at the dew point is the amount of um, evaporation matches the amount of condensation and you reach a 100% relative humidity at that point. And then occasionally you have what's called uh, dew point depression and this is the temperature uh, minus the dew point. And humidity is measured by an instrument called a psychrometer. And I wanted to show you now Another uh, slide that uh, shows a little bit about what a psychometer is. Uh, and it's a very simple uh, instrument, but you know, historically it's been very useful and it's actually very useful, say if you're out on, on a sailboat offshore and, and I've used these before. So the, a simple type of psychometer is called a sling psychrometer. Uh, has uh, you know essentially two thermometers 
uh, one of the thermometers has a little sock or wick of cloth on it, and it's kept wet by a little water reservoir. And uh, the thermometer uh, that has that sock is called the wet bulb thermometer. And the other one, which doesn't, is called the dry bulb thermometer for obvious reasons. Uh, there's a little handle and you can spin this over your head and whirling motion uh, speeds up and causes evaporation of water from the wick. Uh, that uh, evaporation results in evaporative cooling and therefore the temperature read by or on the wet bulb thermometer goes down. And the drier the air around you, in other words, lower the relative humidity, uh, the drier air can absorb more of the moisture more quickly uh, from the wick and causes it to go down proportionately more. So you end up with having a chart on the right, like on the right. And uh, this shows that you can read off, for example, at an air temperature of 22 degrees uh, on the dry bulb. And if you were to spin this around and get a reading on the wet bulb, that is six degrees lower, uh, then that shows that you have a relative humidity of 53%. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but here's just a little um, the thing that's different about a of, vacation home. You this. always help the whole place to. Are you able to hear the, uh, the uh, audio? Hi, and welcome to another Instrument Choice Support yes. video. In this video, okay. we'll show you how to take a relative humidity measurement using the IC736700 sling psychrometer. To do this, you'll need the relative humidity table. This comes with the meter. An example is linked in the video description. And some water we're using distilled. To start, the reservoir will need to be filled with water. It's probably best to perform this outside or over a sink to avoid making a mess. Once filled and the wick is sufficiently wet, close the reservoir chamber lid. It's time to take a measurement. Whirl the psychrometer rapidly for around 20 seconds. After 20 seconds or more has elapsed, record the wet and dry bulb temperatures immediately. Here we've recorded 22 degrees for the dry bulb and 16 degrees Celsius for the wet bulb. To calculate our relative humidity, we need to determine the wet bulb depression value. To do this, simply subtract the wet bulb reading from the dry bulb reading. So in this instance, we will subtract 16 from 22. Our wet bulb depression is six degrees Celsius. Now, using the chart, we'll follow along the top row to find our dry bulb temperature of 22 degrees. Then find the wet bulb depression value on the vertical row, six. Triangulate the two readings to determine the relative humidity value. In this instance, the outdoor humidity today has been measured at 54%. To summarize this chart, the dry bulb temperature is taken directly from the dry bulb thermometer. And the depression of the wet bulb is the dry bulb reading minus the measured reading. For more information on this psychrometer, including a written step-by-step -step guide on how to take measurements. Okay, so I'm going to step back now into the course. And the reason I'm showing you that is, you know, obviously uh, when you're uh, at home and going out on patrols, you can simply uh, look things going up online. Uh, but it's good to know how to do that, particularly if you go on any trips yourself. Uh, you may be, you know, out on the water and very far from any uh, conventional weather stations. Knowing this as well as uh, knowing uh, the uh, any uh, pressure drops will be very important for you being able to uh, predict what's uh, going to be happening with the weather yourself. Uh, so. Uh, when we talk about the relationship uh, between moisture variables, 
uh, there's a concept called uh, saturation uh, absolute humidity. So here uh, we have that uh, measure of grams of water vapor per kilogram of air on the vertical axis. And then uh, we have the temperature now here in degrees Fahrenheit uh, on the uh, uh, x-axis. And you can see that there is a curve uh, that is the uh, line of 100% relative humidity at any given temperature. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, air uh, along that line would be completely or 100% uh, saturated at 100% relative humidity. Uh, things that are low and to the right uh, would be unsaturated and uh, above and to the left would be so-called supersaturated until there's some sort of uh, nucleation phenomena in the atmosphere, for example, uh, small particles or, or salt crystals or something that would serve as a nucleus for water to, to condense. And if we just took a, a, a parcel of air that's sitting out over here at 30% relative humidity, uh, as the temperature drops, it's going to uh, continue uh, until it gets to that uh, saturation uh, line, at which point it's 100% uh, percent, uh, relative humidity. And then you can read uh, the dew point here at say like uh, 53 degrees Fahrenheit. And if you were to plot uh, these moisture variables over a period of time, uh, you can see that there is a relationship between temperature, dew point, and relative humidity. And you know it looks it looks pretty complex, but you can see that as the dew point and temperature get very close to enough one another, uh, the uh, relative humidity peaks here, and uh, relatively speaking, uh, in other places like here and there, and uh, here and there, and so forth. And again, this is because of that ratio. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, and in an earlier lecture, uh, you learned some of the basics of the station model, which is essentially uh, a way of um, very compactly reporting a lot of information uh, at a given place at a particular weather station. And uh, the one uh, now here on the right uh, adds the dew point uh, at 59. and uh, therefore, relative to the uh, temperature of uh, the dew point uh, depression is uh, eight degrees. And this would uh, correspond, say, for example, off of the table uh, that I showed you on the other slide to a relative humidity about 75% uh, or uh, from the uh, graph that was shown on the uh, previous slide. And uh, just as a uh, reminder, uh, the uh, more complete station model, and you'll be adding to this uh, as you go through the course. Again, it's sort of a symbolic representation of weather at any given uh, reporting station. It has uh, a convention that allow uh, a bunch of different parameters uh, to be recorded in a small space. Um, it's most commonly used for surface uh, weather observations, but occasionally is used at higher altitudes and has uh, quite a few element, excuse me, elements in the full model uh, that's used in North America, but the major ones uh, include temperature, uh, dew point, uh, wind speed. So for example, with the barbs uh, here, um, and, uh, uh, so, and then just showing the direction, uh, the, the cloud cover, air pressure, pressure tendency, and, and various aspects of uh, precipitation. Uh, all right. So don't get too stressed out by that slide. Uh, Arnie just threw that in there to, to talk about it a little bit, but that's not something you have to worry about just yet. Right, uh, you'll be adding to your understanding of the weather model over the course. But uh, this just adds now a couple more uh, features to that. Uh, we're going to now switch and talk a little bit about different 
uh, types of fog. Fog can form a number of uh, ways. It can ask, last for uh, hours or even days. Uh, and um, uh, obviously it's something that we're uh, concerned about both in terms of being able to observe uh, directly other vessels in the fog. Uh, and uh, also historically, uh, because of uh, grounding of ships in fog and also inability uh, to, to navigate effectively in, in, in the uh, fog. And fog can form either by a decrease in temperature uh, or by adding uh, moisture, uh, which raises the dew point. And uh, the basic uh, types of fog that are gonna be talked about are radiation fog, which is associated with the temperature uh, decrease, uh, advection fog, which is associated with the temperature decrease, uh, precipitation fog, where moisture is added, uh, steam fog, or sometimes called sea smoke, again, moisture is being added, uh, uh, fog that occurs uh, when you have a, a slope up in geographic features, uh, again, here, uh, as you get to higher elevation, the temperature decreases, uh, or uh, so-called valley fog, uh, which is very similar in concept to radiation fog and associated with temperature uh, decrease. So we'll start out with the last one, radiation fog, and that occurs uh, near ground level uh, where the air cools uh, to the dew point. And remember at the dew point, uh, everything uh, is 100% relative humidity and therefore water condenses uh, at that point. So it's showing in the uh, first uh, frame below that on a clear light with uh, light winds, heat radiates uh, away uh, from the ground and this causes a cooling of the ground and then uh, the air that's in proximity to it. Then in the uh, second panel, uh, heavier cold air uh, just uh, flows uh, into the low places. And then uh, in the third panel, fog forms as the air cools to the dew point where it's 100% relative humidity. And fog, um, though, is usually uh, less than a couple of hundred feet deep. And then in the morning, as the sun comes up, uh, uh, the heat raises the temperature above the dew point, and then the fog quote, burns off. Uh, and in instances where you have very strong winds, uh, this will prevent fog by mixing the cold air that's near the ground with the relatively uh, still warmer air uh, higher up. Uh, then there is advection fog, ad meaning, you know, moving towards something. And here you have warm air moving over a cooler surface that results in lowering of temperature. So if you look at the uh, first pane on the left, uh, you have wind that pushes warm, humid air uh, inland in winter. And uh, again, advection refers to the air moving horizontally. And as that air uh, blows over a cold ground or colder water, such as a cold current, uh, it cools uh, to the dew point and uh, fog forms. Uh, and this advection fog can cover wide areas. For example, in the central U.S. in the winter, it closes airports uh, or over cold water in the lee of warm air coming from land in the spring. It's also uh, common where you have, uh, for example, uh, the, the, the Gulf Stream on the east coast of the United States as it uh, goes uh, north, uh, and, and you can have advection in that as well. Uh, then there's uh, precipitation fog, uh, and this involves evaporating water, uh, increasing humidity uh, to saturation. So on the left, it's showing that some of the rain falling uh, into cool air evaporates uh, if the rain is warmer than the surrounding air. And this uh, adds to the water vapor and this increase is the dew point to the air's temperature. And then the uh, water vapor uh, in that uh, air condenses into small, tiny fog droplets, uh, which
which then uh, uh, refract the light. Uh, then another type is called uh, steam fog or sea smoke. And here water evaporates that raises, uh, again, the dew point temperature. So here in the pane on the left, uh, cold air flows over uh, warm water. Uh, and then uh, the water evaporates into that cold air, increasing it uh, to the dew point. And then uh, at that dew point, water vapor again condenses into small droplets. So, for example, on fall days, you may see quote unquote steam rising from ponds and streams uh, as that fog forms a, a couple of feet above water. And then uh, there is what is called upslope fog, and air is raised. And here they're using a 50 cent uh, adjective or a graphic plane. This basically refers to sort of um, uh, uh, as it's sort of moving along up the mountains and uh, as it moves up along the mountains uh, it at higher elevation uh, expands and therefore cools until it reaches the dew point. So here on the left hand side of the frame is showing uh, the wind blowing humid air and then it goes up the hills or mountains and as the air rises uh, it expands, it cools until it reaches the dew point, and then it condenses, uh, forming some fog that further drift up the hill. So you have uh, a widespread upslope of fog, and this uh, can be common uh, in the Great Plains where land slopes gently up towards the Rockies, as an example. Then there is valley fog, and in valleys, especially in the West, uh, during the winter, uh, you can have very thick radiation fog, more than 1,500 feet. And here, the uh, winter sun, which is much weaker, isn't strong enough to evaporate that much fog completely, although it may warm uh, the ground enough for a layer of fog from around 500 feet up uh, above the ground uh, to evaporate. So you'll have a sort of clear zone uh, for the first a few hundred feet, but then you'll still have a fog above that. And that type of fog can last for many days until storm comes along with stronger winds and uh, pushes it out or causes it to mix. So uh, to summarize uh, the, these major types of fog, uh, radiation fog typically occurs clear nights with radiational cooling in low wet areas. Uh, there may be winds of up to three to five knots that allow for gentle mixing, and then it dissipates uh, with daytime warming of uh, the ground, uh, warms it through conduction and then mixing. Uh, with the valley fog that tends to occur uh, in winter valleys it, associated with radiational cooling, again, there may be winds of, of three to five knots that allow for gentle mixing. Uh, it tends to dissipate when there's a storm with a strong wind that uh, replaces the, the saturated air with drier air. Uh, there is uh, advection fog. Again, here you have warm, moist air that moves over a cold surface. Uh, uh, you can have winds four to 15 knots, um, and it dissipates when the wind changes direction, so the warm airflow is uh, reduced or eliminated, and sometimes uh, with higher winds that were lifted off the ground. Uh, we have this upslope or, or graphic fog that is a warm, moist air lifted by uh, upslope uh, in the airflow and cooled by expansion until the air uh, becomes saturated. Uh, it just requires winds that are sufficient for lifting and dissipates with uh, daytime uh, warming that causes evaporation of the fog or if the wind uh, changes direction, so it no longer goes up the slope. Uh, then, of course, we have uh, precipitation where you have uh, rain from warm air uh, falling through colder air at the surface, saturating cold air at the surface. Uh, winds are, are not uh, relevant and uh, it dissipates when there's frontal a passage or the, the rain ends. And then there's uh, the, the so-called sea smoke, 
where you have cold air uh, blowing over warmer water that takes on uh, moisture at the dew point where it's saturated. Uh, winds can be four to 15 knots and occurs or dissipates daytime uh, with warming or when the wind changes direction. And uh, since I'm, I'm from the West Coast, I'm just going to show you uh, one other uh, type of fog uh, that is uh, called a dynamically forced fog. And um, I have a quick question, if I could ask it. Sure. When when you've got the upslope fog, is that adiabatic cooling that's causing it to expand and cool? Yes. So remember, adiabatic is when you have a parcel of air. When something rises, uh, it expands. There's uh, less uh, motion uh, per unit volume, and therefore the temperature drops. Um, here's an example of what we have in the West Coast, which is a little a bit complicated. It's, uh, it's, it's been uh, nicknamed West Coast fog, and it's due to cooling of uh, near surface air to the point of saturation. It, it, uh, some people used to call it advection fog, but a type of advection fog, but it's a little bit different. So it warrants its, its own uh, uh, name or consideration. So the, um, the advection fog uh, is when you have air that tends to move towards the pole. So if you think of, say, like air in, in say, the Gulf Stream moving from south generally to north uh, and involves being over colder water. But you can see here, as an example, uh, there's an association uh, with these uh, oceanic subtropical high pressure systems where the air uh, uh, circulates, at least in the northern hemisphere, it's going counterclockwise. So you can see with the arrows that uh, you have air circulating uh, towards the equator and it's actually going over warmer water. And um, what's happening, if you look at the bottom uh, two frames, is that you have um, th these very long fetches uh, over the ocean. Uh, much like a wind fetch uh, causing waves to build, uh, analogous to that. So you have these very long fetches. And then it combined with the thermal inversion that sort of caps and prevents mixing of the, uh, of the air. So you get this uh, trapped air where the air slowly cools and becomes moister uh, due to uh, heat exchange with the ocean, the ocean taking heat away from the air and also uh, moisture from the ocean uh, saturating that air. And so you end up with this area of fog that is fairly sharp, as you can see in the satellite image and, and sort of plasters along uh, the coast. And it affects uh, these sort of west coasts in the, both the northern and uh, the southern hemisphere. And just remember, like Arnie said, any of these slides that he adds on, they're, they're not going to show up on the test, so don't get stressed about them. All right. And then go back to full screen. And the last thing I just wanted to mention are dew and frost. So remember, we talked about uh, uh, water having uh, um, condensation when it's at the, the dew point. And if that dew point is above freezing, above 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, then it condenses as water. But that if the dew point is less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, the, you know, obviously the, the water is uh, held in vapor uh, until uh, it reaches that uh, dew point temperature, which if it's below uh, 32 degrees, uh, becomes a solid and, and uh, therefore appears as uh, a frost. 
Okay. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bob. Very good. Thank you very much, Arnie, for going over there, those. And uh, you go ahead and stop sharing if you haven't done that already. And let me go ahead and grab my uh, own presentation here. Um, and while we are working on this, Arnie, if you want to go grab the uh, text and see um, where on there uh, they have the review questions. And while I'm going over these slides, if you want to look through those briefly, I'll have you look at those while I'm talking right now. And ultimately, uh, if you uh, would be willing to share anything when I'm done with the review questions that you think it'd be worth uh, reminding our students about. Um, before we go, any quick questions for Arnie as I'm waiting for this to load on the screen here? All right, let's get into stability. Um, one thing about this class that um, I think is fascinating is um, there are numbers. There are numbers involved which help computers determine what our weather is going to be. And just like we talked about the uh, dry adiabatic lapse rate, using those numbers, you can determine uh, if the temperature and dew point are uh, 11 degrees apart and that parcel of air rises uh, and it cools at 5.5 degrees per thousand feet, the clouds will appear 2,000 feet above or two times 5.5 and cool down to that uh, dew point. But anyway, let's talk about atmospheric stability. Atmospheric stability can have one of three states. The first is absolute stability, kind of boring, right? An air parcel lifted to any height will just simply go right back down to its original position because it is still heavier than the air around it. It's like um, a, a helium balloon that's filled with uh, just regular air and maybe something else that causes it to be heavier than the air around it. it starts to rise and then it just decides to go back down again because it is heavier than the surrounding air so here you have a scenario with your environmental lapse rate and here it shows a nice straight line you know sort of like in a laboratory even though the actual lapse rate varies a little bit in the atmosphere this gives you a much easier way to understand it, is showing it, it, it getting colder and colder as, as the air climbs. So in this case, you have this graph which shows altitude here. So this is higher. The clouds kind of remind you of that. And the temperature is here. So here's cold and here's warm. And so down at the surface, it's fairly warm. And if it was something were to climb, it would climb at five, minus 5.5 5 degrees, uh, degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. But here you have this parcel of air that somehow gets pushed up and uh, just like wah, wah, the Cubs baseball team other every year, it sinks back down again and never goes anywhere. That would be abs atmospheric stability or um, absolute stability. So it's not going anywhere. It's just going to stay where it was. The next scenario is absolute instability, where it's sort of like a, a little kid's birthday balloon where if you're holding it and it's winning the parking lot and it blows that balloon out of your hand, that thing is gone because it is going straight up. An air parcel will rise on its own since the air inside of it is lighter than the surrounding air and only stop when it reaches stable air, such as all the way at the top of the tropopause up around 50,000 feet. So if you're watching um, uh, a thunderstorm, like a really big one in the middle of summer, and you see it rises, 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 and then poof, it flattens out like a, like a thunderhead like this. And that's because it has reached uh, the inversion of the tropopause, where as Arnie was telling us, once you get to the tropopause, above there, the, the air uh, starts warming up again. So it, it doesn't cause, the, the air gets up to there and then it just flattens out because it won't rise anymore because the air above it is even warmer. So here you can see a scenario where here's our environmental lapse rate, but 
as soon as the air starts rising, for whatever reason, whether it's uh, a front has come through or whether uh, the temperature has risen to the point that uh, the water evaporates, well, now that parcel of air is just going to take off straight up, absolute instability. And there, here you can see the air temperature at the ground is already at the same temperature of the environmental lapse rate, and it starts to warm as soon as it climbs. So it's just going to keep climbing like a rocket, uh, but not the uh, SpaceX rocket, which is still sitting on the ground. The third type is conditional stability. Air is pushed up a little bit and starts off, yeah, it's stable. It doesn't really care. Yeah, whatever, you're pushing me up. But then it gets to a certain point and it's like, boom. All right, now I'm warmer than the air around me. So I'm going to take off like a rocket. So it's like, yeah, I really don't want to climb here. You know, front is pushing up whatever it is, is pushing up a parcel of air. But all of a sudden, when it gets up to this point and it's cooled below the temperature, uh, the normal environmental lapse rate, now it's going to take off. So it's conditional stability. What does that mean? Well, initially, the conditions are that it's stable. But when it hits a certain point, it's, it's no longer in the stable condition. It becomes unstable. So initially, conditionally, it starts out stable, and then it becomes unstable. How stability can change. Atmospheric stability is constant chasing, especially in, in, in Chicago or in the Midwest here because the temperatures are always changing. So here's an example. This example shows progression during the day. Here you are on the ground and there's a little bit of an inversion because here, here you see how the, as you rise, the temperature actually um, gets warmer for a little bit until it reaches this warm spot and then because the ground has cooled cool during the night. During the night, the ground has cooled. The air above it didn't cool as fast as the ground below. And so down at the ground, it's cold. And just a little bit above it, it's warm. And so early in the morning, if there was a parcel of air that got pushed up for whatever reason, whether it's a front or whether it would be surface warming, it goes up a little bit. And that's like, nah, I'm just going right back down to the ground again. I'm not forming a, a giant thunderstorm. However, uh, here in the bottom figure, the lower atmosphere is heated. It's the middle of the afternoon uh, and the ground is hot now. And there's no more of this inversion because the ground has heated. You remember it was over here where now the temperature of the ground went all the way up here. And so that the ground is already warm enough that if this air rises a little bit and it starts to uh, get into air around it that is actually uh, colder than it, it's just going to keep rising. So afternoon instability, and that's when you're going to see thunderstorms develop. You hear this is you know showing sun in the middle of the afternoon. So here the dry adiabatic lapse rate is above what a parcel of air was doing, but here the ground is warm to the point that the air right at the ground is already plenty warm, and as it rises, uh, it uh, is an air that is cooler than it, so it just goes straight up. Uh, in, in the stability discussion, how is air pushed up? We talk about air being pushed up or forced up. There has to be a forcing mechanism in order to get air to rise. How does that happen? Or a graphic lifting, and just think about graphics. When you think about graphics, you think about a map, right? So when you think about orographic lifting, you think about moving across something on a map like mountains. So orographic, it's rising terrain, such as the wind blowing up the side of a mountain. And then there's another scenario that causes air to be pushed up, and that's frontal wedging, which is, you know, here comes this mass of cold air and it's riding along the surface and it's heavier than the air it's coming up to. So it's like a snow plow. I don't know if it's down in Florida, you don't think too much about snow plows, but imagine a, a wedge coming along the ground and any snow that's here is just going to get whoop, shot up in the air, right? And that's what that cold front does because the cold air pushes underneath that warm air and the warm air is gonna ride up on top of it. And that's gonna push that mass of air up. So, uh, and you could also have warm air riding over cool air, which would be a warm front. Surface convergence. So here at the surface, you've got a wind coming from the west and a light wind coming out of the east, maybe a lake breeze or something over downtown Chicago. Here comes the west wind, here comes the the, the sea breeze coming off Lake Michigan, they bump into each other here and they go up and that pushes the air up. And once that air starts rising, other things can happen like condensation 
and those will continue to, to be, if it's unstable enough, will develop. Uh, this is where surface winds from different directions meet and the air must must rise because it's got no place else to go. It can't go down, the ground is below. And finally, something we talked a little bit about on those upper air maps, where we talked about two masses of, of air moving along and then they split apart uh, like in front of uh, a, a trough. And at, at, at the high altitudes, when they split apart, that creates like a vacuum underneath. And you have upper air divergence. And now there's the air is being pulled up from below. And now that's going to cause that parcel of air underneath it to, to replace the air that is lost above it. So we'll see example of these in future chapters. But one example is shown on the next slide. And this is a pretty cool uh, graphic here from our friends at the Power Squadron. A Chinook wind, for those of you folks out on the West Coast, you know this well, uh, it's a warm wind on the lee side of the mountain, on the, the downwind side, then the windward side, the air is pushed up the hill uh, orographically. So here comes the winds coming in from the West and it's just pushing this air up. There's no place else for the air to go because it's hitting that mountain, it's going up. So here it is climbing. Now, as it loses moisture, as it gets to the point where condensation starts to occur here, well, now it starts to lose moisture, so the air is, or the air mass is cooling. Well, now it continues to rise, and it starts down here, and it's nice, you know, spring day of 50 degrees temperature. By the time it gets to the top, it's, uh, you know, around freezing. Maybe you have snow here up in the in the Sierras or whatever. But then as it comes down, it turns, it warms as it sinks, it, it descends dry adiabatically. And remember, it already lost a bunch of its moisture. I was in Bend, uh, Bend uh, Idaho, and it was 114 degrees about 10 years ago when I was there. I couldn't believe it. But that air comes down over the top of the mountain. And as it comes down, it warms and it dries. And so here it started out as 50 degree air mass deposited some of its moisture on the mountain. And then as it comes down, it doesn't have that moisture anymore. So it heats up. And by the time it gets down on the other side, it's cooking at 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, it cools at the dry adiabatic lapse rate climbing. And then once it's saturated, it cools at the wet adiabatic rate, which remember minus 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit in the climb. Not as quickly, but it's still, it's losing that moisture. So once it gets down to the lee side, it warms at the dry adiabatic rate again, you know, warms up at plus 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit as it descends. So that's gonna mean warm air by the time it gets to the bottom. So there's other, other places in the world that have other names for it. Does anybody know how this word is? Is this fawn or fawn? Who's, from, who's been in Europe that knows what this word it's is? It's fern. Fern. I need you to enter your fern. Fawn. Fawn. Hold on. Fawn is ringing. E.T. Fun. All right, cool. Thanks for your help, whoever. All right, let's go through the summary and then it's uh, quiz time. First, we'll ask Arnie if he has any other thoughts before we get into the quiz. The atmosphere is primarily nitrogen and oxygen. And this is really helpful to understand how water that has, or, or air masses that have water in them are actually lighter. And that's a key discussion item that's going to come up again and again because you're like, as Arnie said, it's counterintuitive. In your mind, if, if an air mass has water and it's probably heavy, right? But that's not really the case because those water molecules are lighter than the oxygen and the nitrogen. So uh, a variable concentration of water vapor. So at, when air is completely saturated, it still only has about 4% of that entire air mass is actually uh, water vapor. And 1% is obviously much drier, uh, and much drier air. Temperature profile, varies with altitude in four different layers. And to have a clear understanding of this, uh, in the decrease in the temperature decreases in the troposphere, but there's a lot greater variances in temperature down here close to the surface because some places there's, there's shade, uh, you know, some places are, are hot sunny beaches. And so once you get up into the stratosphere, the temperature starts increasing again and there's less mixing compared to the troposphere, which is right here on the ground. Stratosphere is way up there. There's not trees that go into the stratosphere, so there's nothing really mixing in that at altitude. And then once you get all to the top of the stratosphere, the temperature starts decreasing in the mesosphere. 
and the top of the mesosphere is the mesopause. We don't get up there very often, but they're trying to launch a spaceship up there pretty soon. Uh, and then above the mesopause, you have an increase in the thermosphere. Now that graphic that uh, Arnie showed us said the temperature in outer space was around 60 degrees. And I don't know that it's really that warm. I'm not an expert in this. This isn't a, this isn't a, uh, a, an outer space class. We're just talking about the weather. Temperature change with height is caused called the lapse rate. So knowing that the temperature decreases uh, roughly in a dry adiabatic lifting rate of 5.5 degrees Fahrenheit, you can put together a whole bunch of computers that can tell you whether it's going to be uh, a sunny or cloudy day, um, just because all those variables using the using the scientific instruments we have to measure the atmosphere can, can tell you whether or not there's enough moisture for clouds. Um, one of the things early in this chapter that, it, that we touched on real lightly was um, to have uh, condensation, we do need um, uh, something called condensation nuclei. So sometimes you have the perfect situation for uh, clouds to form, but there's no clouds. You're like, well, there's plenty of moisture. What's going on here? And for whatever reason, the, the, the uh, very fickle atmosphere just doesn't have enough dust particles to create those uh, little water droplets in the sky. So that's one other topic we talked about here. Adiabatic lapse rate. And that's how air cools when ascending or warms when it's descending. Summary part two. Water is a very important substance in the atmosphere. Uh, it changes state at normal temperatures. Uh, one of the things they talked about here is the phases. Okay, so it, it, it can carry very large amount of latent heat. So the fascinating thing is when you go from frozen to liquid, it's uh, uh, 80 calories uh, per gram. But when you go from liquid into um, vapor, that's when it's 240 uh, calories per gram. And that's a lot of energy, which is why we get some wicked storms, which uh, Chaz is going to talk about in later chapters. Um, water is an efficient absorber of infrared energy. And the sun is the thing that is kicking out that infrared radiation energy. All right, the phases of water are solid, ice, uh, solid ice, liquid and gas. And one thing, of course, that's interesting with ice is it expands. When water freezes, instead of shrinking to be like tinier and smaller, it actually bubbles up, which is an amazing thing. That's why when you have a, in the middle of uh, winter, when you have a river that freezes, the bottom of it doesn't freeze, uh, the top of it freezes first because that uh, the uh, ice expands. So with ice, for ice going to water, it would be melting or freezing. If it goes from water to ice, that would be freezing. So here we talked about the latent heat, 80 calories per gram. Water to water vapor evaporation or condensation, 540 calories per gram. And finally, sublimation, when it goes right, when, when it sublimes, it goes right from ice into vapor. That, we might see that word again. Deposition, it's easier to remember this word when it goes from just like a gas into ice, like uh, frost on uh, your windshield or whatever. It's a deposit of ice. That's your hint on how to remember what is it called when it goes from a gas to ice. It deposits on your window deposition. But that adds up to this number plus this number, 620 calories per gram. Finally, latent heat uh, in this page. Latent heat is the energy needed to melt ice or evaporate water. So when the atmosphere has a release of this latent heat by condensation, it becomes a major driver of the atmospheric processes, causing the air to rise more rap rapidly and being even more unstable. Um, Arnie talked about uh, humidity, which he did a great job explaining. It's a measure of water vapor in the atmosphere. So the, there's different ways to measure humidity. One is absolute humidity, which is the total concentration in weight uh, of water per kilogram. And obviously a kilogram of air is gonna be a large volume of air. And then there's saturation, absolute humidity. So that's the maximum air can hold at a temperature. The one we talk a lot about is relative humidity. And for uh, a person who's getting ready to go out on a patrol, who's thinking later on when the air cools off, am I gonna be having a hard time to get back to shore because if the temperature and dew point spread is very small right now, 
and the air cools some more, boom, we're going to be having fog on the way back. And one thing that, that Arnie was showing us there is a lot of times the formation of fog is based on when it's not real windy. One time when it, you will be having uh, wind impact the fog there is when it blows uphill or graphic lifting. <clears throat> Relative humidity is the ratio of absolute to saturation absolute humidity. And find the last way when we measure humidity is the dew point is, a temp is the temperature that air must cool at to, I don't like how they were, the, to which the air must cool for saturation to occur. And so if those temperature dew point spreads are getting smaller and smaller, that means we could be having fog soon. Uh, the stability of the atmosphere is its tendency to rise. So this is a chance when you see a lot of instability in the atmosphere, you hear the TV weather people talking about it. That means that the, 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 the setup is right for possibly bad storms. So when you have uh, absolutely absolute stability, means the air if lifted will return to the original height. A lot of time it's gonna be in the morning before the sun is really heated up the ground. Then conditional stability means the air will if lifted far enough, will continue to rise, but initially it, the first initial condition is stability and then it becomes unstable. So conditional stability means it, it will continue to rise if you lift it up to a certain height. Absolute instability means air will rise on its own. And that's, that's a scenario where you have a lot of heat coming in uh, and a lot of moisture available and you could get bad storms there. So what are the four ways air can be lifted? It can be orographically lifted by wind blowing up a side of the mountain. Uh, and sometimes uh, you can actually have easterly winds that can cause lifting on the east side of the mountains here in the United States, but most commonly that's going to be winds blowing from west to east. Frontal wedging is, as we talked briefly about, cold air being pushed, or that's pushing up warm air, just like a snow plow, kind of pushing it up into the air, you know, making it a fly up in the air, just like you peel off a piece of cheese or something with your cheese wedge there. Uh, or surface convergence forces the air between two different air masses to rise. And the last one we're going to talk about is upper level divergence that, that when it peels apart like that, causes that uh, suction above us to draw air. And that's up at the 300 millibar level, you know, real high altitudes. So upper level divergence that's drawing air upward. Um, and if anybody's sending me chats, I, I'm teaching right now, so send them to chats. Uh, real quickly, uh, Arnie, did you have anything else you wanted to touch base real quick before we get into the questions? You there, Arnie? You there, Arnie? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Anything okay. else you, you wanna share? Yeah, I'll, I'll just share one point. Y you, um, highlighted something that is very counterintuitive about the thermosphere. And remember, the, what the graph was showing was the temperature. And so if you have a very sensitive electronic instrument, it's going to show that until you get to a vacuum, the temperature in the thermosphere is increasing. And you had commented that you weren't sure you believed it would be 60 degrees. Well, it can actually even go higher than that. And the reason is that the atmosphere, although at that level is extremely rarefied and attenuated, it's getting hit with all of the ultraviolet and X-ray radiation from the sun. So the molecules that are there are getting very excited and are heat, have heated back up again. However, you're also 100% right that if you were there in a spacesuit as an observer or in an unheated plane, you would experience it as being cold, very, very cold, because even though the individual molecules are moving very quickly, there are not enough of them to result in any heat transfer to you. So it's very counterintuitive in that layer. Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Arnie. You. Uh, any questions before, with, for me before we start asking you questions to see how well you've been paying attention? All right. I notice people always flee this class when we get to the quiz part. So I don't know why that is. <laughs> Pat Musman, in the lower atmosphere, the temperature generally blanks with altitude. Decreases. Good. John Zill, the troposphere is where most of the weather occurs because? Of moisture. 
Moisture Thanks in the air. Moisture. Very good. Excellent. Richard Clements, the two most abundant gases in the atmosphere are? Uh, oxygen and nitrogen. Right on. Very good. Um, where are you? Mike Paragas, a temperature increase with altitude is called what? Are you expecting me to call on you? That's my flotilla commander. I better be on my P's and P's. <laughs> um, temperature increase with atmosphere was the um a tough one we talked about it in an earlier chapter so it's kind of unfair you want to pass you can pass i would like yeah to. mike mcgann i'd say uh, advocation is that the right word uh they're looking for inversion inversion is the yeah. word they're looking for so uh, i also bob i also mentioned that tonight because that's what results in the so-called west coast fog is you have a temperature inversion that caps or traps the moist air below it, resulting in the very sharp fog banks we have out here. Uh, and it's also very important from sort of the uh, environmental uh, viewpoint in terms of uh, inversions trapping air pollution near the surface. Excellent. Amy McPherson, a warm, dry wind on the east side of the Rockies is called what? Is there any? Amy, you with us? No. Bill Luckshaw, you want to take a shot at this? A warm, yeah, dry that, wind. Uh, it's a Chinook wind. Good. Chinook? Who said that? Was that? That doesn't sound like Amy. Who said that? You asked me, Bill Luckshaw. Bill, well done, sir. All yes. right. Who, who is next in our competition here? It looks like uh, Bob Mack. When water vapor condenses, heat energy is? Released. Is that you, Bob? It is released into the atmosphere. Chris McNamara, the energy that is released when water freezes or vapor condenses, condenses is called? It's a tougher word. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the name of that. Uh... We'll give you another try later. Dave Bobos, what is the energy called? What is that called? Late in heat. Late in heat, right on. Late in heat, yeah. Uh, Dave McCollum, yeah. right, saturation. So, uh, what's that? This is Arne. I'll just add that it may be helpful uh, to understand that the word latent uh, comes from a Latin root meaning hidden. So it's basically, it's the heat that's sort of hidden uh, uh, in the water vapor that then comes out when it uh, condenses. Excellent. David Murphy, saturation can be accomplished by what two methods? Um, raise the humidity while the temperature stays and uh, or lower the temperature um, mm -hmm. while the absolute uh, humidity is constant. I think they're talking about cooling or adding moisture, adding water. Yeah, adding moisture. Good. Dean Christie, the temperature at which water vapor begins to condense is called? Uh, that would be the dew point. Dew point, well done. Uh, Derek Steinhoff, when the relative humidity of air is 100%, it is said to be? Saturated. Excellent. If we got more. Uh, Dean, a change in the temperature or density of air without the addition or release of heat energy is called? It's a tough one. You there, Dean? Who are you asking? Dean Christie. Okay, you're hitting me twice, huh? <laughs> no, you know what? You jumped around. Never mind. Ed Hallett, this right. is for you. A change in the a change in the temperature or density of the air without the addition or release of heat is called. Ed. You there, Ed? Yes, I'm here. What was the question? The first one here. A change in the temperature or density of air without the addition or release of heat is called. This is a tougher one. I'll give you a tough one. Sorry, Ed. Uh, adiabatic. Yes, excellent. Well done. An adiabatic process. Jay Zimmerman, the term describing the tendency of lifted air to return to its former level is? Um, form of stability. Um, You're on the right Constant. 
Absolute stability. Absolute stability. Well done. Uh, Jack Benton, the term describing the tendency of air to rise on its own is? You there, Jack Benton? You got to unmute yourself. Jack, you want to take a shot at this one? The term describing the tendency of air to rise on its own is? I think it's absolute instability. Yep, right on. Good. Uh, next one is for Joe Jackson. The term describing the tendency of air to continue to rise after being lifted to some higher level is? Uh, conditional stability. Conditional stability, excellent. And Joel Thalmeyer, the fog that forms at night under clear skies with little wind is called? Uh, radiation fog. Excellent. All right, any questions? Yeah, this looks like it's going to be pretty complicated, huh? Yikes, it's maritime polar, maritime tropical, continental polar, continental arctic, maritime Don't polar. go around I'm scaring them, Bob. I've got to teach that next week. <laughs> Air masses, that's right. The fronts and the cyclones. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop sharing. And we're uh, going to check. Is, this is Arnie. I'll just make one uh, parting comment. So first of all, thank you so much, uh, Bob, for allowing me to share my enthusiasm for the weather tonight with the class and the opportunity uh, to uh, tag team with you. And I just thought of one thing I would just wanted to add about adiabatic. It's, it's a very long word. It comes from the Greek meaning impassable. And the way I like to think about it is think of like a thermos that has like a insulated or impassable wall. It's like a process that is occurring trapped inside of a huge thermos so that heat can't, uh, can't leave it. And so that, that's one way of thinking about it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, inside a, like inside a test tube somehow, huh? Yeah. Good. All right, all right, team, we're gonna go through the quiz questions now. And if I haven't picked on you before, prepare to be picked on. Number one, Mike, in the lower atmosphere, the temperature generally? Again, uh, decreases with the altitude, Charlie. That's correct. How about Mike Patina, number two? The tropopause is important in weather development since it? There might be. Oh, uh, Patina, the Patina. development of could. Convective okay. activity. Good. All right. Last name Patina, P A T E N A. Number three. One difference between the troposphere and the stratosphere is. I think it's C, temperature di distribution. It is C. That's, I thought this was a hard question. Good on you. Well done. I'll, uh, Monique, number uh, four. The most abundant gases in the atmosphere are. Oxygen and nitrogen. Excellent. Oliver, uh, number five, and this is a tricky one because they don't have the right answer on the front of the book. So this is, this is a bad question. The average environmental lapse rate in the lower atmosphere is, and you'd have had to look in the back of your book to find the right answer. So what, which one is it here? Do you know? Oliver? Yeah, I, I ended up looking it up and it should be a minus 3.5. Fahrenheit. Well, it, it's it's D, but it's actually um, minus 5.5, right? Not 3.5, 5.5, right? Because that's the dry. Oh, no. What is D? Is it D? Okay. No, it's D. It's D. The, the, what's wrong is the what is written there. It's it's a I when I looked it up on page 26, it said yeah. minus 3.5 per 1,000 feet. So for this, that is on page 26. Yeah. 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 Right on. Good. Yeah. Throw us a curveball there. Sorry. Good yep. job. Good job, Oliver. Peter, how about number six? A temperature increase with altitude in the lower atmosphere is called? Peter, Axios. I, I don't, um, I'm on vacation right now. I don't have a book. No worries. Um, Ramesh, you want to take a shot at this one? Number six, a temperature Sorry. increase with altitude in the lower atmosphere is called? There, Ramesh? Uh, I skip. <laughs> okay, how about Sean Buckmaster? How about number six? You there, Sean? I think didn't Sean have an audio problem last week, too? Steve Boyer, how about number six? 
Number six, that would be an inversion. Right on, very good. All right, see if I can move my little thing here. Um, Oliver, oh no, I'm sorry, we just picked on you. Bill Madison, number seven, a dry, warm wind descending the east side of the Rocky Mountains is a? Chinook, A. Good. Ed Hallen, number eight, water vapor is added to the air by? B, evaporation. Excellent. Jack Benton, number nine, when water vapor condenses, heat is? Is released. Good. Jeff Link, how about uh, 10? The transition from ice to vapor without going through the liquid phase is called? Yeah, can you hear me, Bob? I can, Jeff. Yep, it's B, sublimation. Excellent. Dave McCullum, how about 11? Latent heat? B is uh, released when the water freezes. Excellent. Where am I here? Jennifer, do you have all these questions ready? 12, saturation can be accomplished by? Um, when the dew point, uh, so the air is saturated when the uh, absolute humidity is elevated and the temperature is constant and um, lowering the temperature while the absolute hum humidity remains constant. So the correct answer for this question is? So that would be C, Charlie. Right on. John Zills, uh, 13, the temperature at which water vapor begins to condense is called the? Dew point, C. Excellent. Uh, C. Mike McGann, 14, if the water vapor content of an air parcel increases at constant temperature, the relative humidity blank and the dew point blank. Charlie increases and the dew point increases. Excellent. Another one for uh, you, Mike, for August 15, when air is saturated with water vapor. Um, it's D David, all of the above. The dew point depression is zero. Relative humidity is 100%. The air can hold no more vapor. Absolutely correct. 16, Oliver, regarding the latent heat of fusion and the latent heat of vaporization of water. Uh, what was that, Oliver? E C. C is correct. Yeah. Latent heat of vaporization is higher, which is fascinating. Pat, uh, the term adiabatic means? No heat is added or subtracted. Yeah. It's like inside of a test tube. It's like a scientific thing. Addison Chapman, 18, the dry adiabatic lapse rate compared to the wet adiabatic lapse rate is? More negative. Bravo. Excellent. Bill Luckshaw, back to you. The physical property or properties of water important to the to the weather is or are? It's uh, delta, all of the above. Excellent. Bob Mack, 20, the term describing the tendency of displaced air to return to its former level is? Um, absolute instability. Absolute stability, good. Chris McNamara, how about uh, 21, the term describing the tendency of air to rise on its own is? Absolute instability. It's wild and crazy. It's absolutely unstable. Good. Dave, number 22, the term describing the tendency of air to rise only after it has been initially raised to some higher altitude is? I didn't know if it was Dave Bobos, but it's uh, D Delta. D Delta. Good. Uh, where were we in all? Dean, how about uh, Dean Christie? Number 23, fog that forms by adding moisture is? Uh, precipitation fog, C. Good. Yeah, remember, that's that's a different one because the rain is falling out of the sky. Finally, how about uh, Jock, number 24, fog that forms under clear skies at night is? You there, Jock? Sorry, I got uh, uh, off the, off the uh, mute there. Hold on a second. Let me get my thing back up. up. This is, is this radiation fog? It is radiation fog. Good. Okay, sorry. All right, guys, if you want to turn your cameras on. Hmm. At one point, we had 44 of us here tonight, but we lost a bunch of people when I started calling questions. Cowards. <laughs> buck, 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 buck. But you guys did great. How are you feeling? You notice, I mean, it is tough stuff, as uh, a couple people have said. It is, it is challenging. This is not an easy class. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm so challenged. It looks like I'm, you know, I'm dematerializing here or something with this video.
Um, the, the explanations you guys give make it much easier than just reading the material on your own and trying to understand it. So thanks. You're welcome. And get excited because next <clears throat> Tuesday is Chaz Haig. And if you think me and Arnie are smart, Chaz is very bright. Engineer. Woo -woo. So look forward to having another really great session. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, do we have any other questions before I start throwing it out for, for general stuff? Yeah, I got one question. The chart or whatever that, that um, Arnold was referring to about, uh, you know, uh, the temperatures rising as the, you know, in the altitude. Now, you made a comment in it, and it, the light went off my head about something. What was that chart he was referring to? Is this the one talking about the different layers of the atmosphere? It is in your student. I'm pretty sure that, that I think it's- Is that the chart student. he was talking about? Good. Okay. Is that what you were talking about, Arnie? Uh, for that question, yes. It's the one, let's see. It's on page 26. Yeah, okay. Good. But yeah, you made, you made a comment about where when you're in the airplane, you know, even though the, the you know, the, the molecules are getting- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah that was specifically uh, for the thermosphere. So that, um, well, there, okay, the airplane was a question in the chat, uh, and that's a different layer. I think that was the troposphere, okay. uh, you know, the 30 to 40,000 feet. What I was talking about with respect to the question in the class was the thermosphere, which is much higher. And uh, that's where, if you were to electronically measure the temperature, because the actual individual molecules are very excited by ultraviolet mm -hmm. radiation from the sun. Right. The temperature theoretically would read very high, but if you were up there in a spacesuit, you would be frozen stiff because there's not enough air around for it to transfer any heat to you. Right. So it's yeah, very yeah. counterintuitive. Yeah, well, when you said that, there's not as many molecules, that's when the light went off. Ah, oh, okay. That yeah. is why when you're in the plane, it does feel colder. Because, yeah, you don't have as much molecules to get all excited to actually heat the air up. You can feel it. Yeah. And the molecules it, are moving very fast. They're moving so they're very at fast. high temperature. But there are so few of them that there's no yeah. heat content. Yeah. Right. There's, there's another term that's used. I don't want to confuse people. There's another term that's used, and it's called anacoustic. So above 160 kilometers, the air is so thin, it, sound doesn't transmit. So mm -hmm. that's another term. If if you go into meteorology, you may hear the term word anacoustic at that at that level. It means without sound. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording.